Thanks to Capcom for sponsoring this video. When you're a kid, no day of the week is more precious than Saturday. You had a grueling five days of school and this is your day to relax. Play video games, watch TV, and stay up as late as you want since there's no school on Sunday. Unless you're Catholic. Like I was. No matter what you had planned for Saturday, you always wanted to have a strong start to your weekend. And what better way to start the day than with Saturday morning anime? That's right, this is a new generation. Saturday morning cartoons? Old. Outdated. Saturday morning anime? Cool. Hip. Shows like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Sonic the Hedgehog, Kirby Right Back At You, One Piece, all of these shows played an integral part of our childhoods. And there's one little company we can thank for that. For Kids Entertainment. Hey, have you heard of a little game called Resident Evil 4? From the creators of the Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes comes the latest edition, Resident Evil 4, the game that changed horror and video games forever. The game's got a 93 on Metacritic, but a 100 in my heart. How could it be any less with full-time handsome man Leon Kennedy staring at me? But why I'm talking about this game today is because for the first time ever, Resident Evil 4 is on sale. 34% off for a limited time on PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox Series S and X, as well as PC, of course. Included will be the Mercenaries update, where you can put yourself to the test in an exciting classic time attack mode. If you've never had the chance to play this awesome game, then there's no better time than now. And if you click my personal link in the description, you'll also receive one month of Discord Turbo. I'm also really excited for the Separate Ways DLC that'll put you into the perspective of Ada Wong and how her actions coincide with Leon's story. And just like this remake, it'll of course have new mechanics and experiences. The DLC will be available on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC on September 21st for $9.99. So come on, what are you waiting for? Leon to look less hot? That's never gonna happen. Click that link down below to get 34% off Resident Evil 4. And thanks again, Capcom. I love you. Yeah, does that look familiar? 4Kids was an American licensing company that provided English dubs of anime and even a few original cartoons of their own. Making their debut in 1992, the first anime they were in charge of dubbing was a little show called Pokemon. Definitely a massive first gig that was obviously a massive success. And a lot of the things you loved and remembered about this show were things done by 4Kids. The iconic and unique voices of the characters, the theme song, the gosh dang poke rap, all things that were created in mind for a young American audience. Now, so far I've had nothing but great things to say about 4Kids. So why is this video called The Annoying World of 4Kids? Well, despite creating English dubs and cartoons of shows we loved as a kid and never really thought deeply about, they did also make some... weird decisions. These donuts are great! Jelly filled are my favorite! That line right there. Now, I don't know about you, but those are some weird looking jelly donuts if I've ever seen them. Well, once you get past the age of six, you'll definitely realize those are in fact not jelly donuts. But actually, Onigiri, or rice balls. A Japanese food made of white rice usually formed into triangular shapes and wrapped in nori, which is edible seaweed. The rice ball itself is typically filled with salmon, katsuoboshi, kombu, tarako, mentaiko, and takanazuke. This is a very typical dish in Japan, almost as common as, well, jelly donuts are in America. However, onigiri is not very common in America if it wasn't obvious by me butchering the names of the ingredients. And American children are just so stupid, they could never understand the idea of a rice ball. So to save us stupid kids some trouble, four kids just decided to rename the food entirely, calling it a jelly donut. This is really what four kids is infamous for. Dumbing down anime to make them as child-friendly and harmless as possible. For shows like Pokemon, I totally get it. Edits need to be made in order for parents to not get upset and have the show cancelled. There's the infamous episode where James wears an inflatable woman suit that gives him big boobies. Like yeah, it's hot, but for a kid's show, you can definitely see where it might be a bit... much? And in the same episode, Brock gets a little worked up seeing all these half-naked women and... wants to grope Ash? This is not the fun Pokemon adventure I was promised. Or the time someone threatened to shoot Ash in the head. It definitely would have made his journey a lot shorter. These episodes obviously were never released outside Japan, but the weird edits and censorship choices do get more obvious and egregious depending on the show. So what I want to do today is have a little retrospective on 4Kids. Talk about the good, the bad, and the completely insane choices that we had to witness on Saturday mornings. 
Whether you watched your 4Kids programming on Foxbox, 4Kids TV, the CW 4Kids, Toonzai, there's a lot of different names depending on where you lived. 4Kids though, after the massive success of Pokemon Indigo League, was on a roll. Leading to their next massive project. It's time to do 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 Yu-Gi-Oh! A show similar in concept to Pokemon, starring a bunch of child protagonists needing to collect and battle monsters to save the world. This time in the form of a card game, making collecting the cards in real life all the more immersive. The show was just as big as Pokemon. I didn't even watch that much as a kid, but still collected the cards because everyone else was doing it. And they all looked more... anime. Who are you and why do you look like this? Yu-Gi-Oh! had a bit of a more mature feel to it. Sure, there's the occasional whimsical kid moments, but the overall tone was more dire. The theme song and background music all had this epic orchestral sound to them. Not trying to sound radical or silly, but more dramatic than anything. Plus, the monsters being more serious and threatening looking as opposed to downright adorable made the battles feel really intense. You might care if a cute Pikachu gets stabbed with a sword. But when it happens to a holographic demon monster, there's no worries. Yu-Gi-Oh! was actually a pretty intense show in Japan, having a lot of violence and character deaths, while the 4Kids dub never really had a character die, but instead be sent to the Shadow Realm. You'll also notice a trend with voice acting in 4Kids shows, which I'll definitely be pointing out in every anime. A character will talk like this to really show that they mean business and are super serious. It's treated more like a cartoon, having every character have a distinct voice so the kids don't get confused. Little boy Yugi is voiced by this grown-ass man, and it's so jarring to hear. Usually in anime, they get a woman to voice kids, so it sounds more natural. But here we get... this. Actually, Taya beat you five times in a row, Joey. Twelve-year-old kids don't sound like that. One of the more beloved characters of the show was someone named Jonoichi. Or, as you may know him in English as... Joey. Names of characters were constantly being changed because Jonichi is once again too hard for stupid Americans to pronounce. Joy was also given a New York accent for... reasons? Ugh, I must have been nuts to think I could ever learn this crazy game. To be fair, he was always the one that stood out to me when he talked. You should have paid more attention to my last turn, Keith. Hey, it's me, Joey. I'm gonna battle you with my, uh, blue eyes white dragon here. Pizza. Now, I haven't watched every episode of Yu-Gi-Oh!, but spoilers, apparently. Joey dies at some point in the original show. Straight up, just dies. And I don't think this ever happened in the 4Kids dub. Apart from death and gratuitous violence, Yu-Gi-Oh! was fairly untouched by 4Kids in terms of edits. Because of that, the show left behind a very positive legacy. Between Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh!, kids had a blast choosing their sides and collecting the cards. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s darker tone, though, definitely goes unmatched. Okay, now I definitely have no idea what the hell this is. Mew Mew Power! The show just screams early 2000s anime. The crude art style, the amateur voice acting, the pop-punk intro, making a teenage boy sound like a 40-year-old? Well, I was wondering, if you don't think it's too weird, want to take a walk to the park with me? I'm definitely 15. After watching a few episodes, I kinda got the grasp of what's going on. So, this is your typical magical girl anime, where these teenage girls gain the power of the endangered cat girls, giving them Mew Mew power. This is so awesome! I can't feel my feet! If this show was ever on TV, I definitely never watched it. It was a little too, uh... I don't know... girly? Yeah, I know! Whoa! Did he just smile like that because of something I said? However, watching it nowadays really feels like stepping into a time machine. I wish I could see weebs from the early 2000s. You ever see that one cringe commercial for an anime convention? Hey, I love anime! Yeah. And manga! And gaming! I wanna be there. Right now. I mean, the show is pretty much exactly what you'd expect. These girls deal with day-to-day -day high school drama in their personal life, and eventually need to transform into superheroes to save the day. If you like that kind of thing, then this show will scratch that itch. In terms of 4Kids edits, there really wasn't that much done. Character names were once again changed, with the main character Ichigo now being named Zoe Hansen. Yeah, mucho sugoi. 
The only other edits I could find were in the girls' transformations, where there's parts where the girls look a little... underdressed, so those sections were just removed entirely. I honestly don't have much else to say regarding the show. It's an alright magical girl anime, and for Saturday mornings, it fits the bill. Oh, oh, it's okay, Zoe, and I had a nice time too. We should do it again sometime. So, let's go from a show I didn't watch to a show I watched religiously. Yo ho ho, he took a bite of gum gum. One Piece! One of the most beloved anime and mangas of all time. A series that's still going strong to this day. What are they on, like episode 900 now? That's not even a joke. A show about a young boy who ate a magical fruit and now has stretchy powers. He gathers his pirate crew together to sail the Grand Line to find the One Piece, the biggest piece of treasure hidden throughout the land. The show is instantly likable with its quirky characters, engaging plot, and absolutely high levels of ass-kicking. There's just one little problem, though. One Piece can sometimes be a little... violent. There's lots of guns, blood, and, you know, that which isn't exactly gonna fly for a Saturday morning cartoon meant for little kids. So, you know what that means. Censorship! Lots and lots of censorship! A dart piercing through Luffy's arm and shooting out blood is now... a rubber dart. You know, that comes out of a Nerf gun. The 4 kids dub of One Piece is infamous for being the most bastardized version of an anime to ever exist. Riddled with terrible 4 kids choices all around. I mean, where do I even begin? Four kids didn't even know anything about One Piece when taking on the job of dubbing it, and when they realized, hey, this show's kinda violent, they wanted to pull out entirely, but Toei forced them to do it. Some characters had their names changed, like Smoker is now Chaser, Ace is now Trace, and Zoro, one of the main characters, was renamed to Zolo. His name's Zolo, he's just like the samurai! The voice acting is definitely hit or miss. Luffy's voice is serviceable, if not a little poorly directed, but overall, Erica Schroeder did a good job. Ah! Gum, gum. Ah! Zolo is voiced by Mark Dyrason. Sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce your name. He does a really good job, honestly, one of the highlights of the show. Hey, Mr. One, tell me something. When Crocodile trained you, did he say, sit? Now let's talk about one of the worst voices ever recorded. Sanji. Yeah. What voice should come out of a smooth and suave chef who's a total ladies' man? No, one of my rules is the guests don't work. Yeah, okay, great. A taxi driver from Brooklyn with a sinus infection, why not? Oh, love. Smile on me, for I cannot endure such suffering, such sweet sorrow. Hey, it's me, Sanji. This is totally my voice. Sanji also smoked cigarettes in the show, which is a big no-no for a children's show. So they edited the cigarette to instead be a lollipop. Four kids made Sanji the least cool character ever. Luffy would also do special attacks and say things like Gum Gum Bullet or Gum Gum Bazooka, which hey, those are guns. So instead, now he says, Gum Gum Blast, or Gum Gum Rapid Fire. A lot of the side characters and villains were also given silly voices. Mihawk, the big bad swordsman of the series, now has a French accent. Shanks has an Australian accent. Nico Robin has a cowgirl Texan accent. Why does everyone need a funny accent? Whenever Mr. Zero needs a hand, I answer the call to arms. Like, I get it. Under four kids, One Piece is now a kid's show but it's such a terrible source material to try and make for little kids. At least, that's how I feel as an adult. How did I feel as a kid? I absolutely love this show, are you kidding me? Sanji's voice was cool as hell when I was nine. Because don't get me wrong, even under the four kids umbrella, One Piece still held up because I was a kid. It was for me. The opening theme song is really what hooked me back in the day. I don't care who you are, if you say the pirate rap sucks, you need to be hung from the gallows. Here's how the story goes, we find out by the treasure in the grand line, there's no doubt. It's so good! One Piece is also a fairly long anime, again, 900 plus episodes as we speak, and 4Kids actually cut out a lot of filler and slow moments. Moments that, sure, are important to character development, but... This version of One Piece clearly doesn't care about the story, so why not trim the fat? We also got tons of really solid video games, my personal favorite being One Piece Grand Adventure on the GameCube. An arena-style fighting game. Maybe I'll talk about One Piece games one day. Heck, I'm still nostalgic for a lot of the character voices. Zolo! What's all that noise? 
Sanji's lollipop. I want to find out what he's always slurping on. Eventually, Funimation would pick up One Piece to give it a more faithful and uncensored dub. When I first heard these new voices, though, as a kid, I hated it. Zoro's four kids voice is still my favorite. Luffy! But most importantly, four kids introduced One Piece to the world and managed to do so at a young age, introducing us to the world and characters. A lot of One Piece fans grew up on the 4Kids version, and are able to look back on it with fond memories. At least, to an extent. Maybe the One Piece we were looking for... were the terrible dubs we made along the way. An anime about Sonic the Hedgehog? What could possibly go wrong? Copyright Strikes yeah, I made a review of Sonic X years ago, but YouTube hates everything about it, I guess, since the entire video is now blocked. So, I will talk about Sonic X right now, you'll just have to look at gameplay instead. I'm sorry. The show is about as Saturday morning as you can get. It's essentially a Sonic Isekai, where Sonic travels from his home world of Green Hill Zone and ends up in New York City or something. Yep, Sonic now lives among us and befriends a kid named Chris Thorndike. He's your average kid that no one understands, with his mom, dad, and butler always giving him commands. Nah, but for real, his parents are never home and he's super lonely. That is until a little blue hedgehog comes into his life. Rich kids always get everything. It's a pretty simple show about Sonic the Hedgehog. Has a nice balance of action, comedy, and... romance? There's nothing really egregious about this show. The dubbing is well done, the theme song kicks ass. Nothing to really comment on here in terms of four kids' involvement. But hey, it's a pretty big part of Saturday morning cartoon history. The only real negative about the show was Chris. Because he's a stupid little kid. I'm the stupid kid who should be with Sonic! Sonic X, though, isn't the only video game Saturday morning anime that had the involvement of four kids. Kirby Right Back At You made its debut on October 6, 2001, running up until September 27, 2003. The show had four seasons, combining 100 total episodes. That's really impressive. The show was on many channels, depending on your country. Episode 1. There's a giant tentacle monster attacking, and I immediately fear this is going places I hope it won't. It turns out, however, he's just hungry and wants to eat some sheep. And he does, raining the bones onto the sheep's owner. Oh my gosh, that is so brutal. Who said Kirby was a lighthearted franchise? Apart from me a million times. And as the sheep herder looks on at this giant monster, horrified at the sight of his animal's demise, as well as his possible impending doom, we get the intro. Kirby, 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 that's a name you should know. Kirby, 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 he's the star of the show. Well, that was quite the shift in tone, but I'll take it. This theme song is quite the gem. It's got that old school 1950s jazz hands kind of vibe to it. You feel? It's really catchy, and anyone who grew up with the show will join in with you if you start singing the lyrics. After the intro, we're introduced to our main villains, King DDD and his right hand... Uh, snail, Escargoon. <laughs> Little fella wouldn't hurt a fly unless it was on the end of a fish hook. Oh, jeez. So, in this show, King DDD for some reason sounds like a mob boss, or a gangster. Which is kind of fitting, since that's sort of his role. Throughout the show, we'll see DDD taking orders from this business schmuck on a TV, representing Nightmare Enterprises, an evil company started up by Nightmare himself, telling DDD what to do, essentially acting as the company's muscle to do all the dirty work. Like, you know, showing up in a tank to destroy nature and take out a wise sentient tree. Gosh, back to the dark stuff already. Luckily, however, this plan is thwarted when a ship crashes into the tank, causing a commotion. And who else should be in that ship other than our cute protagonist himself, Kirby? Oh, Kirby, Kirby! DDD attempts to murder him, but is quickly saved by these two kids. In case you were wondering, my name's Tiff. Name Tiff. And I'm a brother. Tough, tough. Tough. This is Tiff, and that's tough. These two kids quickly befriend Kirby since, well, wouldn't you do the same? We then get some vintage Kirby action. 
While these kids try to learn more about this sweet puffball, we see him in watermelon fields eating watermelons whole, as well as being invited to a city dinner. While he inhales and consumes everything while the villagers look on in awe. Kirby, though, just doesn't care. He eats their food and then wanders off without a care in the world. <laughs> I should have started eating. Eventually, that giant octopus comes back looking for more trouble. But this time, the town's got a secret weapon. Kirby! Squidward here shoots fire out of his tentacles. Somehow. But oops, this is a Kirby we're dealing with. So he inhales the flames and gains the fire ability. Kirby then has a really spectacular and awesome fight with the beast, until he's eventually slain. Unfortunately though, Kirby's ship is now fixed, and it's time to say goodbye, leaving his new friends. Or does he? <laughs> we'll make sure that don't happen. Goodbye for good! <laughs> Okay, well, you know what, DDD, this is your fault. He shoots Kirby out of the sky, his ship breaks, again, but this time, just decides, hey, this planet's pretty cool, I'm gonna stay here. Kirby! Kirby comes to Cappy Town as a really solid first episode, and sets the tone perfectly for what the show's gonna be all about. As you might have guessed, Tiff and Tuff essentially take on the role as the main characters, with huge air quotes, and essentially become the focus of the show, since, as Tuff points out early on, and as we the viewers witnessed with Kirby's lack of speaking ability, Kirby is just a baby. Some might view this as a bad thing, since the show pretty much focuses around Kirby, and not specifically on him, but I think this was for the best. If Kirby spoke too much, it would be really weird, and we might have another Link on our hands. Oh boy, smooching time! Ah! Oof. You suck! This was a choice, however, made by Masahiro Sakurai himself, the creator of Kirby. He had two requests upon the show's creation. One, Kirby would not talk, hence why he was probably written as a baby. And two, there should be no humans. Soji Yoshikawa, the producer of Right Back At Ya, mentioned how difficult it was to create a show where the main protagonist couldn't speak, as well as building a world full of characters with no humans. The end result is a really unique mix of smaller side characters from the games, now given a more prominent role, as well as solid original characters. I'm Takori, and I'm 100% pro-tree, and this gumball's Kirby. Oh, it's an honor to meet a famous tree like you. Speaking of the visuals, I adore how Kirby right back at ya looks. Its aesthetic is able to capture the same joy and lightheartedness as the games do. Sakurai was heavily involved with the show's production, stating in an interview with Famitsu, saying, I was considerably involved with the production of the anime. The aim was to create an anime that could be enjoyed by children and parents at the same time, just as the games. At first, Kirby began as a game that even a beginner could enjoy. I believe such a spirit was achieved in the anime. And he's right, the anime's tone and feel is very much in line with the games, primarily being upbeat and with a focus of putting a smile on your face. With Kirby's constant need to eat anything and everything in sight, all while looking absolutely innocent and adorable. Hey, Kirby. There's an episode where the Waddle Dees leave the castle and become servants to everyone in town, essentially becoming like the iPhone, just a product that everyone casually has, all included with a Waddle Dee vending machine. Now I can stay open 24 hours and still get a good night's sleep. There's an episode where Kirby eats a naughty, a creature that infects him with a sleep virus, in which, you guessed it, he can't stop falling asleep. What I'm trying to get at is that the show has a fairly carefree feel, but just like with the games, the anime can flip that switch, and its tone and mood can feel very tense. Usually when a dark and dangerous threat is looming over our lovable protagonists, or a major fight is about to occur. Oh yeah, the fight scenes! How have I not mentioned them yet? A constant theme throughout the anime are the transformation sequences. Yeah, whenever Kirby is about to get into a fight or save the world in some way, he'll go through these transformation scenes that are unique to each ability, similar to Sailor Moon. Just way cuter. 
I love these kind of things. Coming from someone who watched Power Rangers religiously, I always get hype during any kind of transformation from regular old Joe to superhero. But, at the end of the day, Kirby Right Back At Ya serves the same purpose as the Kirby games. To give the viewer a temporary escape from the harsh day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of reality into a cute and fun world that you can't help but smile at. Every Saturday morning, my 10-year-old self was glued in front of the TV watching the show. I would be genuinely sad when I missed an episode for whatever reason. Kirby helped relieve any stress my young self was going through with school, homework, my D-minus grade average, you name it. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Turtles are one of those evergreen shows where no matter what year or generation you're a part of, you'll have your own version of the Turtles. The 80s had the campy cartoon, the 2010s had the Nickelodeon era, and for us kids who grew up in the 2000s, we had... The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Bracket, 2003. Mmm, springtime fresh. The series was actually co-produced by four kids. That's right, a four kids cartoon built from the ground up. This version of the Turtles was awesome, having a really slick and clean anime aesthetic. Be ready for anything. I am so gonna enjoy this. Maybe I'm just biased, but I really feel like this show struck the perfect balance of comedy and action. Ah, sweet double phoenix punch! Hey, you know this one? Ah! All of the characters have their patented personality traits, but none of them are too over the top. Like, Donatello is still a brainiac, but he's not a wimpy little nerd. Same with Michelangelo. He's funny and silly, but still kicks ass when he needs to. Don, are we beating them, or are they beating us? It's actually the first serious take on the Turtles. The storytelling was turned up a notch and even had a fairly dark tone overall. The Shredder had taken my master Yoshi from me. From the world. It's crazy because it's four kids! One Piece was too dark for them with the constant censoring and attempt to make it lighthearted. But with the Ninja Turtles, they really tried and succeeded at making a serious show that all fans of all ages would like. It also has the best Ninja Turtles theme song, that's a fact. Oh, brother! The show had five seasons, all packed with really good stories. My personal favorite being the Mutant Arc, where people all around New York were being mutated with the same ooze that turned the turtles into pizza-loving ninjas. But all the people turned mutants weren't as lucky. Some of them were horrifying monsters still having their humanity. They hate what they've become and are sad they may not be able to return to their normal lives, while others are angry and used as weapons. Yes, it is wondrous. A world where even mutant turtles can freely walk the streets. It is such a good interpretation of the turtles. And I wish it had that mainstream love similar to the way Avatar The Last Airbender does. A mature anime made in America for kids that still holds up. Season 6 and 7 acted as a spin-off slash miniseries, TMNT Fast Forward, where the turtles time travel to the year 2105. It's the same show, but now with future stuff. It's more lighthearted and goofy. Still a good series, but lacks what made the first five seasons so lovable. Oh, and don't even get me started on the video games. TMNT 2 Battle Nexus is still one of my favorite games of all time. I think we definitely have this show to thank for showing the world that a serious Ninja Turtles can work. It doesn't just have to be a silly show about talking turtles. You can actually tell serious stories with them, and people will love it. Okay, this is Dinosaur King. I'll be honest, I never watched the show as a kid. Be careful, Max. It might be dangerous. And exploring dangerous stuff like this is exactly what D-Team is all about, right? So I checked out the first episode, and... It's Yu-Gi-Oh, but with dinosaurs. Here we go! It seems kind of unfair, don't you think? Like, if some kid has a Tyrannosaurus card, doesn't he just automatically win? The main character has a baby Triceratops. It's kind of like his Pikachu, and no offense, man, but what is that really gonna do for you? The show is honestly Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! paint by numbers. 
a group of three friends who collect cards and battle. Here, read the manual! This show, however, stands out with its dinosaur CGI. Yeah, it's a little rough, but... I, no, there's no excuse for it. It's horrible. That's about all I really have to say, honestly. The show's fine, but it's just Pokemon. Or Yu-Gi-Oh, or whatever I said. Oh, so Ursula. Fantastic, Xander. And I said. The character designs, though, are really unique. I love them. There you go. I said something nice about the show. Fighting Foodons, a Japanese manga turned anime about anthropomorphic foods that do martial arts and fight amongst each other for food supremacy. I love that. Fighting Foodons, otherwise known as Martial Arts Cooking Legend Bistro Recipe, was a manga series appearing in Comic Bonbon, bon, which was a manga series for kids. It made its debut in 1998, so pretty much peak Pokemon time. So, in this world, there are these magic meal tickets that, when stuck into food, bring them to life. Where the big baddies plan on using that power to take over the world. And it's up to your child protagonist to stop them. Simple, yet effective. Dude, now this is how you design your main character! They're so chaotically 90s, it's perfect. Hey! <coughs> stop eating and start battling, kid! They're the gluttons! Mmm. I think I'll have another order of red beans and rice. And since it's the 90s, our main characters' names are Chase and Kayla. You know, whatever white people's names work best. They really make a good duo. Child protagonists in these kind of shows just work better. Hey, wait a minute! You owe us money for all that food you ate! Now, while Pokemon has Pikachu as their mascot, Fighting Foodons has Fried Ricer. Alright! Fried Ricer's ready! He's basically Chase's main food on, and he's pretty kick ass, I'm not gonna lie. This whole show just kinda does everything kinda right. It was dubbed by four kids, which I know in hindsight makes you roll your eyes, but hey, it's a company called Four Kids making a show that's four kids. So yeah. The music, the voice actors, they all do a great job in portraying the silly and chaotic nature of the show. I'm gonna add some vinegar! It sure seems to be doing wonders for old Noodleator! Ah! Hi, Dan! This is no time to be worrying about cooking! And I think that's Fighting Foodon's biggest strength. So many Pokemon knockoffs try to be serious or focus on being cool to the kids, and in turn just makes the franchises feel really generic and uninteresting. Fighting Food On seems to know that its concept is ridiculous and just runs with it. When it comes to fighting gluttons, we rebel chefs have to stick together like peanut butter and jelly. Fried Ricer speaks like a Pokemon, only being able to say the words fried and Ricer. Ah, Ricer! Fried Ricer! Despite apparently just being a human with a fried rice bowl head. I don't know. But then there's Sir Dumpling, who only speaks in British catchphrases. I got it! Here we go! Pip pip! Golly! Why? I don't associate dumplings with Britain. It's literally just a stupid four kids choice. Golly God! Pip pip! Here we go! It isn't the greatest show in the world. I mean, I don't think anyone was expecting that. There's only 26 episodes, so there's not a ton you'd have to dedicate your life to if you want to watch the show. But even then, sometimes 26 episodes feels like a lot. It's cute when the foods get introduced and have a little battle, but the plots themselves are never anything too engaging. It's literally a show about kids playing with food. Oh, you want to be talented cooking? I'll show you cooking! So my mother's recipe for fried rice, will ya? I'll show you! But I love the strong Saturday morning cartoon vibe to it. I don't know why I have such a soft spot for the show. I guess the ridiculous concept and execution of it all really warms my heart. The fact that it's trying something so outlandish. And hey, it's got a cat girl. Furries all around the world love fighting foodons. There was a video game on Game Boy that looked pretty much like Pokemon. Well, at least they're not trying to hide it there. Fighting foodons wasn't a great show, but it definitely was a show. Viva Piñata is one of the shows of all time.
All right, man, what the heck is this? The only thing I know about Viva Pinata was that they gave away the game for free at Burger King when you ordered a kid's meal. Burger King straight up were just giving these games away. And I still never played it. At least Sneak King was kind of a fun game. Burger King really tried to appeal to gamers, didn't they? What a horrible time 2009 was. Anyway, they made a show about this video game that literally 20 people played. I don't even know what the concept of the game or the TV show is. I watched a few minutes of an episode and immediately went insane. Did you know that Columbus sailed to America on a piñata? The Nina, the piñata, and the Santa Maria? The piñata! <laughs> Here, I'll read the Wikipedia synopsis to see if that helps clear things up. <clears throat> On Piñata Island, piñatas of various species roam the garden freely, eating candy and coexisting with one another in a peaceful society. When a piñata's candy inside reaches a high enough level, they are sent to a party via the Piñata Central Cananyota, where they will be broken open by the partygoers before being repaired and returned to the island. The series follows a group of close piñata friends and their day-to-day -day lives on the island. So it's a show about nothing. Every episode follows a random annoying piñata just living their life. And really, I mean, how much damage can a half a dozen apples do? I don't know if anyone ever watched this. If you did, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to know how you felt about it. For me, it was just too annoying. I couldn't figure out the main character since everyone was a hyperactive annoying monster. Somehow, I blame Burger King for this. Oh boy, speaking of 3D monsters... And then, that's when I saw him. Way in the back of the body's pit. Sitting in a pile of junk parts and scrap metal, here was someone who could change my life. This is Cubix. So this is a show about racism. I'm serious. Cubix takes place in the year 2044, where robots and humans coexist. The main character's name is Connor. That's me! He has a deep fascination with robots, while his dad absolutely hates their existence, and thinks they should drink from separate water fountains. So just toss it in with the rest of the trash, and let's get back to work. I'm not too sure what this show is. Wikipedia says it's an action-adventure, but there's very little adventure, and even less action. I mean, I guess there is kind of an early 2000s charm to the show, whether it be the terrible CGI, terrible voice acting, terrible intentions behind those eyes, you name it. I was pretty mad. I mean, they were making fun of me. But I guess I deserved it. It's a show about robots that I couldn't even stomach for one episode. Sorry, Cubix fans. Chaotic. Not chaotic, like I thought it was for years. Now this show has an incredibly unique concept. You see, it follows these kids who collect trading cards and use them to battle one another. It's crazy! What an imagination, huh? Yep, it's everything you've seen a million times. The only difference here, I think, is that the monsters themselves are tied directly to the user, which is pretty cool. Meaning if you live in this world, you don't exactly want to carelessly go into a fight, since if your monster dies in the game, you die in real life. I think. I didn't really read the chaotic handbook. <laughs> the visuals are pretty unique, ditching the more traditional anime style and going for a more... What would you call this? 16 look? Mobile game cutscene look? I remember seeing the cards all over toy stores when I was younger. Of course, I just bypassed them and went to the Yu-Gi-Oh section, but still. Tom, it's a password! You got a password to Chaotic! The show is honestly fine. I honestly didn't even want to include it in this video because I didn't have much to say. But I know someone out there will be happy to see it mentioned. So, this is for you. But now we gotta talk about something that's been ingrained in my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, 4Kids presents to you... The United States National Anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. This is absolutely insane. For the reports we watched were so gallantly streaming. 
I sometimes still refuse to believe this is real. The four kids cinematic universe really came together for this one. We have Japanese anime and video game characters like Sonic and Luffy singing the United States National Anthem. I feel like Japan will never forgive us for this. And I think that's a pretty good high to close out this video. Saturday mornings are an integral part of any kid's childhood, and four kids was definitely a special time to be alive. So whether you grew up in this time or wanted a taste of the 2000s, I hope you enjoyed your time with me. Now go outside and enjoy your weekend. And if you're watching this on a weekday, I'm sorry.